Medicine really is at a crossroads. Medicine has been on a very long journey. You can go back and look at it from the beginning of time, but more recently, in the last century, the prevention and treatment of infections became very important. Then we started looking at the treatment of symptoms. And what that meant is we wrote out that golden prescription for the patient. And most of us in this room were taught what we call protocol medicine. Everyone got the same thing. So if the patient came into the emergency room for asthma, there was a protocol, you followed it. But that is not where medicine is in 2010. Science really has changed. Anti-aging medicine is at the forefront of this change. In anti-aging medicine, it does not treat just the symptoms. It tries to find the cause of the problem and treat the cause. Anti-aging medicine in doing this is about personalized care, individualized care, because we now have the science to look at what each person needs for their own health care needs. And the, probably the easiest way I can show you this is a case history. 54-year-old executive who comes to see you, in this case we'll say it can be a male or female, and they want to know what they can do to prevent having a heart attack. The father had a heart attack at the age of 56, grandfather died of acute MI at the age of 60. Conventionally, this patient would have a cholesterol panel drawn, an EKG, and a stress test. If everything was fine, they would be sent out the door. The trouble is, one half of people who have a heart attack have very normal cholesterol. So we would miss one half of the people. When you look at an anti-aging approach, it is very different to this patient. There's many other risk factors for heart disease. Cholesterol fractionation or particle size is very important. Homocysteine, lipoprotein A, C-reactive protein, ferritin, fibrinogen, LP, PLA2, and looking at hyperinsulinemia and metabolic syndrome are equally as important as looking at cholesterol. High cholesterol itself doesn't cause heart disease. Having a high cholesterol is a manifestation of there being risk factors present. Hormonal imbalances are risk factors for heart disease as well. When we look at estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, cortisol, thyroid, and insulin. So let's look at an anti-aging approach to this patient who comes in to see you. First of all, we would want to look at a cholesterol fractionation or particle size. Small, dense LDL is high in about 30% of people worldwide. This increases the patient's risk of having an acute MI threefold. The large, buoyant cells are the ones that we want. When the patient has the small, dense LDL particles, they penetrate the arterial and endothelial lining very easily. If you look at the different kinds of HDL, the HDL2, B, and 3, which are the more protective ones, are low in 25% of the population. The HDL3 component gathers up excess cholesterol. It becomes H2L2, uh, B, in people who are healthy in reversing the cholesterol transport. How about homocysteine? Homocysteine is a very interesting amino acid. You can have high homocysteine for a lot of reasons. You can be like me. I have an MTHFR deficiency. I've tested my genomes. I'm heterozygous for this deficiency. So there's no surprise that in my family we have two major diseases breast cancer and heart disease, because we have this particular SNP. You can also have a genetic predisposition in something called a CVS deficiency. And here, homocysteine and methionine levels are high. This one is much more rare. When women lose estrogen at menopause, homocysteine can climb. Nutritional deficiencies can cause high homocysteine. 
just the aging process itself, diabetes, being male, if the patient smokes, they can have a higher homocysteine. If they drink too much, they imbibe with a lot of caffeine, like coffee can be a problem. Hypothyroidism predisposes the patient to a high homocysteine. If they have renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, or stress. So there's a lot of reasons people can have a high homocysteine. The good news is that everything I'm talking about this morning is something that we can fix metabolically in anti-aging medicine. If you look at homocysteine further, 43% of the CVAs, 28% of peripheral vascular disease, and 30% of coronary vascular disease or angina are related to high homocysteine levels. High homocysteine levels are also associated with many other diseases. So the patient has a high homocysteine, which is really perfect six to eight. Even though your lab may say it's 15 or 20, per Dr. McCulley, who is the one who founded homocysteine, and I've had the privilege to sit under his tutelage, normal homocysteine is six to eight. And so these are the numbers that we use in anti-aging medicine. It's not just about normal, it's about optimal. And so if the patient's homocysteine is not optimal, six to eight, they have an increased risk in depression because homocysteine is part of the methylation pathway. They have an increased risk in osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, dementia, a huge increase in memory loss if they have high homocysteine, diabetes, SLE, cardiovascular disease, spina bifida and neural tube defects in a child, breast cancer, I could put prostate cancer there, CVAs, MS, spontaneous abortion, placental abruption, rheumatoid arthritis. All of these are major risk factors if the patient has a high homocysteine. But again, conventionally in medicine, we would not be measuring this in this patient.